Assalamu alaikum, hello, howdy, and welcome to our viewers today. Whether you're catching this live or on many of our recorded platforms, we here at MPAC are so thrilled that you are watching and joining us today. As always, my name is Iman Ali, and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. With Eid al-Fitr soon approaching, we wanted to give our viewers a real treat this evening. So joining me today is MPAC's very own Hollywood Bureau Director, Sue Obeidi, who I could go on and on and on about because she is just one of the most wonderful people on our team. Um, and with her amazing work at the Hollywood Bureau, she sees the importance of representation in media, especially children's media, which is why we decided to have our media powerhouse equivalent guest panel to speak on this issue and the amazing projects that they are working on. So without further ado, I want to introduce Sasha Palladino, who is the creator and executive producer of Disney's Miles from Tomorrowland, an animated intergalactic adventure series and the first children's program to appear in outer space in an international space station. Our next guest is Rizwan Manji, who is perhaps best known for his character Rajiv Gudwani, the hilariously scheming, and I can attest to this because I loved watching the show, hilariously scheming assistant manager on NBC's Outsourced and currently stars on NBC's Perfect Harmony, Sci-Fi's The Magicians, and Pop TV's Schitt's Creek. Next up is Dan Milano, who has written and performed for animated shows including Star Wars, Detours, Dawn of the Croods, and Robot Chicken, and co-created the Fox live action series Greg the Bunny. And last, but certainly not least, Zara Faisal, who is a voice actor who credit, whose credits include Young Justice Outsiders, Voltron Legendary Defender, Bojack Horseman, She-Ra and the Princess of Power, Craig of the Creek, Adam Ruins Everything, and Lost in Space. Our guests today will be speaking on their experience working in children's media and on, sh and, and on shows like Disney Junior's Mira Royal Detective and Glitch Text, a Netflix original series produced by Nickelodeon Animated Animation Studios. So now, as they say in showbiz, the show must go on. And with that, I'm going to pass over the conversation to Miss Sue. Thank you, Iman. You're amazing and such a pleasure to work with. I just adore you. Iman will be back later with questions from our viewers. So if you have any questions, if you're on Zoom and you have any questions, please uh, do, um, put them in the chat. If you're on Facebook Live, put them in the comments section. Um, Dan, Zahra, Sasha, and Rizwan, thank you for joining us today. You know, I came to America as an immigrant and even as a five-year-old, I was drawn to storytelling, especially in the medium of television. But like, but like so many underrepresented communities, I didn't see myself. I didn't have anyone that looked my, like my family. But when I did, it, was, it wasn't good. It was absolutely vilifying. So that is why we adore you and you are so special to us. So thank you for being here on a Saturday afternoon. I know you don't have any place to go, but still, you could have done that. <laughs> thank you. You're reflecting the narratives through your respective crafts. And while we have so much work to do, and I don't want to underestimate the work that still has to be done, we're seeing the effort move the needle in the right direction. And in that, and in the right direction means in, in, the, in the direction of meaningful, meaningful inclusion and more authentic portrayals. I want to thank my colleagues at Impact for their help in organizing all of this, all this and for being behind the scenes and pushing the buttons they push. I also want to give a shout out, a very special shout out to my colleague, Martine McDonald, who's an expert on children's media and the founder of Practice Wonder. Look it up. Practice Wonder. Martine and I last month curated a list of eight shows that you and your family should be watching um, together and for Variety Magazine. And Glitch Text and Mira Royal Detective were two of the eight. So thank you, uh, Martine, for all your hard work as well. So let us dive in and start with um, you, Dan, and you, Sasha. Um, we're going to show some clips, but before we do, Dan and Sasha, please tell us. How, how did the concept of your respective series come about and then set up the clip that we're gonna, clips that we're gonna see? So Dan, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Sasha, then we'll go to the clips. Um, well, thank you, Sue, um, and I'm so happy to be here um, representing our, our show and our, our writers and our, um, our producers and everyone at um, 
Netflix is distributing the show and Nickelodeon Animation who developed and produced the show. Um, Glitch Text is a um, uh, animated adventure series, 22 minutes um, for really all ages. Um, and it focuses on a group of young kids that work in the IT department of their favorite video game company, but their job is to secretly um, not only be servicing your equipment, but the uh, real life video game creatures and phenomena that are manifesting out of this one company's uh, video game products. So they sort of go in like paranormal police and deal with the problem. So it came from the idea of finding new ways to empower kids, um, particularly with the now 50 years of video games and technology that we have been um, growing steadily with, especially in the last couple of years, and what a normal part of life it can be for so many people, um, and to try to kind of bridge the gap between generations on this issue, um, and also to be, you know, very inclusive of, you know, the world we live in, because now with the electronic handshake, of course, like the world is, you know, more in touch with each other on an uh, global level. So, you know, the show was really a chance to do a love letter to um, the game and, and technology culture. Uh, the clip that you're going to see is a bunch of our kids who are on a routine job. Uh, our two young protagonists are new to the job and they are seeing some experts at work and admiring their handiwork for the first time. So it's kind of an introduction to what glitch texts do. Great. And Sasha? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sasha Palladino. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Impact. We're so honored to be a part of this and to be associated with you guys, and you've helped us so much, and we appreciate everything you do. Um, you really inspire us. So um, I'm the executive producer of Mirror Royal Detective, which is an animated series that airs on Disney Junior. I'm excited to represent it along with Rizwan. Um, and uh, the show premiered right before the world stopped spinning uh, a couple months ago. Uh, and it's been in development for a long time. Um, Disney and a writer named Becca Topol, a great writer, were developing it for a number of years before I came along. And I think the impetus was really um, because there hadn't been uh, an India-inspired world seen in animation in this way. Um, and Disney was really excited about the idea of a female lead character um, from South Asia. And, um, and it sort of developed and developed into this story uh, about a girl who is very curious, very perceptive, um, and notices things that no one else does. And she's the royal detective. She is the detective for the royal family, but she's the first, after a long line of men with mustaches, no offense, there's one. Um, she, <laughs> uh, she is the first girl um, and first kid to be royal detective. Um, so it's a big deal. And so, although she works for the royal family, we think of Mira as the people's detective. She really helps everybody, um, whether it's a kid, a commoner, a royal, a goat, she's just there for everyone. Um, and what we're so excited about with this series is just the chance to represent South Asian culture um, for kids and for the world. Um, you know, it's a big responsibility. It's a big privilege and we want to get it right. We want it to be authentic. Um, and we want to, we're, we're all, everyone who works on the team, we also, you know, there's about 40 or 50 of us here in LA, but we work with an animation studio in India, um, Technicolor. And so there's another 170 people there. Um, working on the show and 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 for them, I think especially it's it's a huge responsibility to know that they're creating a show that will represent their culture to the world. These shows air in 50, uh, 150 countries. So um, so it's, you know, we want to we want it to be authentic and we want to um, we want to do it right. So um, the clip you're going to see is along those lines of doing it right. Um, it's uh, one of the first episodes that um, Rizwan, one of Rizwan's characters, Rizwan, Rizwan plays two characters. Um, and this one you're going to see Mr. Khan. Um, and this is a Muslim family uh, that lives in Jalpur. Jalpur is the name of the kingdom in the show. It's, it's based on Rajasthan, the real area in northern India, but we made up the name of the kingdom. Um, and you're going to see Mira and her friends at the end of solving a mystery um, where they meet up with Mr. Khan and his family to find uh, some very important cinnamon sugar that they really need for a ladu recipe. <laughs> Thank you. 
Release more string, beta. <laughs> That's it. There he is. Yes. Mr. Khan, we're so happy we found you. Hello, girls. What can I do for you? I really need to get your special cinnamon sugar. I'm making ladoos for my papa. Sounds delicious, Mina. And you came all this way for my cinnamon sugar? We sure did. Yours is the best. Are you going to have to go back to your shop to get it? I know you're enjoying family time. That is very thoughtful of you. But I should have some extra cinnamon sugar in my bag. I always carry some spices with me. Let me check. Please have some mint sugar. Please, please, please. Ah, here it is. Yes! How much do I owe you, Mr. Khan? You came all the way here for my cinnamon sugar. Please accept it as a gift. Oh, I've never been so happy to see a spice bag in my life. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Mina. Let me finish her. Uh, what about its splash radius? That was an order. Okay, then. <laughs> Glitch contained. Whoa! Anish and Zara were so cool out there. Why don't you go talk to him? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know what I'd say. Just say, hi. You're pretty cool. You can do it. Uh, hi. Hey, what's up? Um, I just wanted to say, uh, you guys are pretty cool. Oh, thanks, Hi Fly. See ya. Hi Fly. Hey, look at the bright side. They almost knew your name. Awesome. And Dan, did you want to give a shout out to Eric? Yes, Eric Robles is the originator of the Glitch Text uh, concept and my creative partner. Partner Together, we are co-executive producers of the show uh, and co-creators. And it's just exceeded, I think, our every expectation because um, the collaboration on the show was so rich and so many people both uh, here in the U.S. And, and at our animation companies overseas and um, France and the Philippines just brought, and Australia brought so much of themselves to the project. Um, and we also have a phenomenal uh, voice cast who all uh, fleshed out the characters with us in process, including Zara, who plays um, Zara. She's one of the um, core Glitch Text cast there. Thank you. So this question is to all of you. What does inclusion mean to you as creatives, whether you're a screenwriter or an actor, and how do you lead on creating that mindset within your team? Um, and because so much is at stake right now, especially when we're at home longer than we thought we were going to be, the, the, the responsibility is pretty enormous at this point. So what does it mean to you when we say inclusion? And, and when I say inclusion, I mean meaningful inclusion, not not just you know a character passing by or something someone in the background but real inclusion like we've seen on your shows um well i'm i'm happy to say i feel like it, it shows are almost always about creating a family of some sort no matter the genre you're creating a core group and it's just important that of course there be representation from um you know all walks of life that people in our audience can can look and see themselves reflected in the in the substance of the show. I also just make the point to anyone I work with that what I've seen happen is that anytime I'm surrounded by people who think differently than me, were raised differently than me, have something to say that I wouldn't say, I can also be proud of just the originality. Um, it it when you don't have diversity of voice, things are, you know, become grossly similar. Um, so it's, 
you know, it's, I think, the spice of good content to, to stay fresh, to stay original, to stay relative, um, and not just continually show variations on the same point of view. And then, of course, as just a, a human being with any ability to influence work, especially work that will reach um, not just general audiences, but children. I mean, the opportunity to allow those children to see themselves or see a world that includes you know, others um, that should come as second nature to them is so important. I, I'm uh, so influenced by Star Trek. And I, although I did not grow up someone who wasn't seeing themselves as a protagonist on a million other TV shows, I had so many people come and tell me and or and when I was in fan groups, I saw the power that the diversity of that show and the themes of that show brought to people, just with the representation that they were there as equals. The, the characters were all represented. So it started for us with that. We just want to see faces um, on this team. And then as they developed and people took part and fleshed it out, it became something so beautiful that I just, it's the, my favorite project I've ever been on because there's so many things that still surprise me and you can't have that if everyone in the room is just cut from the same cloth. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, to answer your question, just to give a shout out to both Sue and Dan, um, uh, to uh, um, Sue and Sasha, and uh, uh, is that, you know, without collaboration, there's no inclusion. And I think I had posted a photo of my uh, character from Mirror Royal Detective, and Sue contacted me and said, hey, uh, we have these writers wondering if you guys could, uh, if you could uh, get in touch with Sasha and get us connected. And I, you know, as actors, we get nervous. We're like, we don't know how this is going to be received. And it takes somebody like Sasha to be like, hey, yeah, I want to uh, um, get me in touch with Sue. And then they had their own discussion. And then this happened. And there's stuff that we can't talk about as well. I know Sasha, so I won't say it. No, no, I can tell you. I can tell you though, based on that, I, I was, I, I was, a lot, I was told I could say this, um, just because it's oh. such a oh, good. <laughs> well, one part of it, not every part of it. Anyway, the one part I can say because it all connects is that um, based on that conversation, um, Sue ended up introducing me to a great writer um, in the Muslim community who's now writing an episode for us. Um, and Please. so to me, that's it that's the heart of it and um and from my perspective as a showrunner it's similar to what dan said i mean i i want to hear new voices that i've never heard before um and for a show for me as a white guy as the showrunner of a show about a culture that's not my own um what i've really learned um is that one of my bus biggest jobs is to listen um you know what i'm bringing to the table is hopefully my experience as a storyteller and someone who knows about this audience but, um, but it's also important for me to, to admit and be very upfront about what I don't know. Um, and that's why it's so important to include other uh, voices, um, South Asian voices, uh, uh, voices from different religions, um, different perspectives. And to me, that's, that's what makes the show so rich and deep and hopefully authentic. I yeah, Absolutely. And just to kind of echo off what Dan and Sasha, you guys are saying, I think you only learn from people who are different from you. That's where true growth and learning begins when you're surrounded by different perspectives, because um, it allows you to think of things in a way you haven't thought of before. And so I love the fact that television is diversifying not only in its casting, but in its writers, in its producers, just in its consultants, because all the different people getting together, you birth a new idea, something that hadn't been there before. And I think when I think about inclusion, that's what it means to me. It's like this involving of different authentic perspectives. And um, it's also something to me that I love that Glitch Text does, is it presents a, an ensemble cast of all different races and ethnic backgrounds, all different genders, without comment. We all have American accents. And to me, as an, you know, a Pakistani Indian American, it's so important to see people of my ethnic background not made foreign in media, but American. So I think that's a, a huge part of inclusion that's happening right now that I love. Absolutely. And I, and I want to, I keep saying like it's meaningful inclusion because, you know, when, when, um, 
when we were starting to be noticed as a community, it, there was inclusion in that we were in the background, we, we really we didn't have any lines. I really feel it changing. Again, I want to underscore that we're not where we need to be, um, but we are so much further along than we were even three years ago. And, and that's largely because of people like you, creators like you. I do want to just say on a personal note, you know, and not giving up anything with Glitch Text or Mira Royal Detective, that, that you were all so gracious, all of you. When I emailed Rizwan about the writer for Mira, um, if Sasha, you responded immediately. I was overseas. I was in Amman, Jordan. And I, it was one of those things where I couldn't just n ignore an email because I was on vacation. You know, this is our, this is our um, image that we have to protect in America and, and globally. And, you know, it's no secret that Muslims have, a, you know, have been vilified in the industry. So any opportunity. I was floored when you responded within probably, I think it was like, I think because of the time difference, it might have been immediately, but it was like maybe 12 hours later or 10 hours later. And then Dan, Dan, you and Eric and your team, I, I you know, I sat with you and um, on numerous occasions. And when I was in Jordan one year, we were going back and forth on the name. Do you remember all that? Yes. And down to that. And it was crazy. And then Zara, God bless you, you know, you recommended us to another studio that got another writer hired. So it's all connected. Um, so all of you are- But it's going back and forth. Like you are helping us so much too, Sue. Like you, you know, in terms of graciousness, you invited me to this um, Eid well, dinner. And I had never been to an Eid dinner before. And it was fascinating. And I learned so much about, so much that I didn't know. And that all fed back into the show. So- Can I, can I tell you something random, Sasha and everyone? It was a year ago today, May oh. 16th. We wow. had an amazing on um, wow. industry wow. star um, at Sunset Gower Studio, uh, Netflix. I think it was at Netflix that year, but um, it was amazing. And those those events really are time consuming. But I have to tell you, I miss them so much. Fasting and breaking my fast alone with my with my sister. But I mean, like I miss the people. And yeah. so a year ago today, it's so odd that you would say that. Wow. Yeah, so odd. Um, anyway, I, did you want to say something, Dan? I'm sorry. I, I did want to comment on how we we came to work with you, yeah. Sue, because I, I have to say a, a great example of how uh, things came together very organically was that we had um, a really talented writer and a show creator um, involved with the show named uh, David Anaxagoras. He had oh. created a beautiful show for Amazon called um, Gordimer Gibbons, Life on Normal Street. And he was working on early episodes of Glitch Text with us. We were talking about the industry, about sh shows in general. And he made a comment, oh, you know, I always regretted I didn't get another season. Uh, we were about to introduce um, uh, you know, a, a Muslim female character on the show, and it was so important to me to do this. And 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 he started talking about why and why why that was important to him, why that was important for uh, the community, the Muslim community, why it was important for women, why it was you know. And in hearing him, it started as a conversation about a missed opportunity. Two, um, you know, middle-aged uh, Caucasian men have doughy Caucasian men having a conversation, saying, "Yeah, uh, too bad. That's too bad." You know, that would have been great. And then, because this is, it took me a minute, because I have the privilege to take a minute, I suddenly went, oh yeah, well, well, we could do it. <laughs> you know, like, like well, well, wait, we have an opportunity right here. And I, I, it, it, I tell the story because it, I think it's an example of how for some who are privileged enough to make the mistake, it, it could have just flown out the window, mm. but it became everything. Because just discussing that, we we were already in the process of designing most of our characters, but we took it to our designer, we took it to my co-creator, Eric, we took it to the network, and the response from everyone was like, great, we have to make a few changes, but yeah, let's, let's do that. And it was just as simple as asking, as expressing the desire and thankfully everyone got behind us and in that process i believe it was uh, megan casey who was our executive in charge 
um, had heard with uh, of MPAC or possibly consulted with you previously and recommended we all meet. And it was such an organic discussion. It was just a, a, a sit down and a get to know each other. And that's all it ever has been, is just a conversation. You know, I'm, I think that people who are creative, if they're real nerds for it, and I am surrounded by and a lifelong nerd, we're hungry for information and we want to learn so much and we want new tools in the toolbox. And so it was just a wonderful thing to, to immerse ourselves in these details. And it just was a very easy collaboration. So, and I wanted to make that point because I think it reflects well on, on impact that you were all so approachable. You didn't come with a list of rules or something that was defensive. You just came with information, just thoughtful information and questions. And we just found so many aspects of the character together just in discussing and, and the aspects of the show itself, not just that pertain to Zara either. It's a long journey and it's a partnership. So we would not, we would not have it otherwise. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. The next question is actually for uh, Rizwan and Zara. Um, so both of you voice, um, Zara, you voice many uh, characters on Witch Text. And oh. then Rizwan, you voice two. Um, of course, one of them is um, Mr. Khan. And your main characters are very strong, confident, positive, and proud M Muslims. Did, how did you embrace the responsibility of representing communities that have been, you know, vilified in the past. I mean, did, did you have a moment where you felt that responsibility? And then I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but did that ever come into play? Uh, <laughs> I'll start. Um, <laughs> that was me going. <laughs> Um, I was so excited when the audition for Zara came from my agent. And I think uh, I had auditioned maybe once for Glitch Text before for another part. And then I saw this Zara audition and I opened it and was very fortunate to see sometimes when we get auditions, we don't know what the character looks like. But in this audition, I remember it was a drawing of Zara concept art. And I think she had her her fist up and you could see her tech gauntlet. Um, she looked cool. And so my first thought was like, wow, this is a cool girl. Reading her description, it was like how she was almost this big sister type to the other younger glitch techs. She was more experienced. She was a YouTuber. She had her own gaming channel. She was very cool. So I was like, wow, okay, this is a cool girl. This is like a cool big sister type. The fact that she was Muslim didn't really factor into my creative approach to what I thought she would sound like. I just knew I wanted to make her cool. And I knew that I, I wanted, if I were to play this character, my hope would be the first, when you think of her, you don't think of her as the Muslim one. You think of her as, oh, the sarcastic, cool one. And so that is kind of how I approach all of the characters I play, regardless of their race or ethnicity or whatnot. I don't think about the burden of representation because that would not allow me to do my work as an actor, which is bringing an authentic perspective, emotional being to life. And um, it's only after the recording process and when it's released that I start to think about the burden, quote unquote, of representation about fan response. And, you know, I, I hope that I've done my part of the job to make a, a believable fun character. Like if I've done my piece of the puzzle, I trust the incredible artists, the incredible writers, everybody to create something together that is a wonderful character for kids who happens to be Muslim. Um, very good point. Very good point. Who happens to be Muslim. Absolutely. And that's where, that's what we want. Absolutely. Thank you. Rizwan? Um, I haven't done as much voice work. Uh, uh, actually, Mirror Royal Detective is one of my first uh, uh, voiceover for animation. So my main thing was, please don't get fired on your first job <laughs> as a voice actor. <laughs> so that's what I was most concerned about. But in all seriousness, uh, I think it's, it's, you know, what Zara said, like, look, he was, it's a character, the character's name was Mr. Khan. I don't even think I saw a drawing at that point. I was just right, so happy that, that he would, I, there wasn't right there was no right, right, yeah yeah there was no drawing and so um 
it was just making the character believable and real and sort of uh, being with people who you trust are going to do that and looking at the, the, the script and, and, and saying, look, this is, this, is a, this is a regular guy who I would be proud of my kids watching this on, on, on TV. I think for the on-camera stuff, I, 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 I have felt uh, in the past, being in this business for a long time, I have felt that burden. Uh, I may, I don't think I've always made the right choices. I think I've discussed this with you, Sue, about my experience with the show 24, but I don't know if I've always made the, the, the right choices, but I have felt that burden. But I do feel like I take everything by a case to case basis and I go, look, how can, how, how does this help? How does this change the conversation? All, all that stuff. I, I don't want to say that it doesn't come into my mind, but I but I do agree with Zara. At the at the end of the day, you're saying, look, when you get this, when you get this role, how do I make this three dimensional? How do I make this authentic? How do I make this person somebody that I would feel comfortable uh, for my community and my kids to be watching? So yeah. Thank you. Uh, if I can just stay with Zara, Zara and, and Rizwan real quick. I mean, you have been in the industry for a while. In fact, Rizwan, you were part of our Hollywood Bureau promo video that we actually never launched, but I'll, and I'll tell you why later. Um, <laughs> I, hope it was, I hope it wasn't that because I was terrible. <laughs> awesome. And we're probably going to probably use snippets of it, but I'll tell you why we never released it. Um, yeah, I'll tell you later. But I want to stick with World you. exclusive scoop. <laughs> It, it really, it's no big deal, but um, um, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of conversations. We were actually in Utah together on a panel, remember, with that press tour? Yes. Uh, that was really interesting, but I want to stick with you two real quick. Look, before the, the new, this administration, before this administration, um, on, on my end, on Impact's Hollywood Bureau end, um, we were doing more proactive outreach, right? So we, we, you know, we're not a watchdog. Everybody knows that. But we would, you know, make phone calls like, hey, you know, we're here. If you, you, you know, need, need a, a resource, we're here, you know, for your show. After the elections, um, the phones just started ringing off the hook. Mm. Okay. We were getting um, calls proactively, you know, helping to create characters and, and what have you. I want to ask you two, in the last maybe three, like four or five years, actually, have you seen, how, what is your feeling about inclusion of Muslims, um, Muslim characters, Muslim Muslim actors, screenwriters? Again, I want to underscore, we're nowhere we need, where we need to be, and I don't want to sugarcoat it, but have you felt a, a change um, that you could notice and feel? Go ahead, Rizmo. Oh, <laughs> I just got a payback. That was great. <laughs> um, look, I have to say that, yes, I, um, I also have been on the other end of trying to produce uh, shows for, uh, you know, the, the kids market, not animation, but live action, and also on, you know, for the regular networks as well. So we have a bunch of projects and the, the, they're more, there's a more openness to having a, uh, a Muslim lead character as well. Like the, it's almost the, the, the fact that the having that character is opening up rooms, like they're willing to see us, they're willing to have this conversation, they're willing to have a pitch meeting. I just think that there is definitely a, a more openness. We're not where we need to be. I, we haven't yet, I don't, I don't think seen uh, uh, something that scale even on um, uh, network TV where you feel, uh, oh, great, there's just this like Muslim family. I, I don't know if we're, we're, we're there yet, but it's, I would say, and I don't know about uh, what Zara is going to say, but I feel, I feel that there has been a change and I feel like it is for the positive. There's still a long way to go, but we're, we're definitely in a positive area. I completely agree. Um, you know, from my perspective working on camera, I feel like there's a lot of people who care, a lot of creatives who care and who are trying. Uh, that doesn't always mean the result is going to be perfect, but there are steps, the first steps being taken, which hopefully mean the second and third steps will be good. As a woman, Muslim woman, it is a little frustrating though. In my on-camera career, I largely play if I'm playing a Muslim woman, she's wearing a hijab. And uh, sometimes 
I'm playing someone who is not American. So there's a lot still of this othering and a very kind of singular way and like, oh, we know it's a Muslim woman because she's wearing a hijab. When we know that being a Muslim woman, being a Muslim is a spectrum of all different appearances and ethnic ethnicities and choices and cultural wear. So I would love to see things move more in that direction. Um, but again, first steps are good steps. Now I'll say for animation, I think children's media is way ahead of the game in terms of positively representing Muslim characters. And I think that's ultimately more valuable. Get them while they're young, I say. <laughs> like get people comfortable with Muslims and Muslim cultures and break down the stereotypes at an early age so that as those audiences get older, they'll live in a less fearful mindset of, of, of Muslims possibly. Um, so like, I really am excited to be working in animation at this moment in time because of people like Dan, because of people like Sasha and because of, you know, people, there's a lot of people who care a lot in children's media about getting it right. And so that to me is very, um, positive. And, and I, I, I mean, I don't want to, um, label those who work in children's media as just being simply amazing, but <laughs> <laughs> but if the shoe fits <laughs> that might be the truth like, no i do think that that a lot of people who get into kids tv or media for young people are doing it for good reasons like yes. we want to put something positive out in the world um and you know you know that because you don't make as much money <laughs> as if you were i was, like, I was yeah. gonna say <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly um so it's not always about that like there are you know, I, you know, it's hard to have a career in the entertainment industry at all, as everyone knows. And in some ways, it's even harder to have an a career in the entertainment industry and feel good about what you're doing. Um, so I feel like the four of us, I would imagine, are all very fortunate to feel that way, that we're putting positive things out into the world. And I, and I have a feeling with the pandemic and with the, the state of the industry as it is and with production, I, I really feel that children's media, as Silver said, this is gonna be a, really a focus point, a focal point. So I think, I think this is amazing. I mean, everything happens for a reason. And so I'm very hopeful that they will see more representation. Um, and just a quick note, Zara um, on Thursday was on how to get away with murder. Oh uh, yeah. You were, and that was awesome. That was a season finale or? The series finale. Series finale. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations on that. Oh, thank you so much. It's fun. <laughs> Um, just sticking with um, Dan and Sasha, if I, if I may, um, you've both been um, in, in the helm of children's um, stories that explore cross-cultural understanding and the cultivation of empathy. What do you envision then is the future of the content for children and coming of age stories in the next, say, three years? Um, and then also, let's talk a little bit more about the pandemic and where animation might be going in the next handful of years where we're, where the industry is still trying to figure out how to do this um, with the, with the say, uh, social distancing issues. So if you can, either one, just jump in. Um, all right, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, in terms of the future, I mean, to me, it's just about more voices, um, more voices that we haven't heard before. Um, and the voices that we have heard hopefully taking in what's in the world and um, processing it, including the pandemic, <laughs> um, and processing it in a way that is useful. Um, you know, for us, um, figuring out how to portray South Asian culture has been just such a joy. Um, and, you know, it's hard, it's really hard. <laughs> and there's a lot of issues and, and difficult questions that we have to wrestle with. Um, and we spend so much time thinking and talking about it, but it, that's what makes it worthwhile, I think, um, because we get to these answers after questioning things from such so many different angles. And I, I guess my hope is that the future of kids TV is more of that, more questioning, more pushing the envelope, um, more seeing things uh, from different perspectives. To me, it's about different perspectives. And, and that ties to empathy as well. Mira um, in our show is such an empathetic character. That's what makes her a good detective. She can get into someone else's shoes. And I can't think of anything more important than that in this day and age, the idea of seeing the world through someone else's eyes um, as a way to um, 
have perspective on how other people experience the world in ways that are different from you. So um, that's what I see in, in a, when I'm in a good mood. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I agree and I, I think, um, you know, with Glitch Text, we do the, the, the show intended to sort of embrace geek and gamer culture in a way that we hadn't seen in other um, properties because very typically there would be the, the connotation of, of, of geek and gamers as other, as, uh, as, as uh, offbeat, as uh, disconnected, as uh, potentially toxic. And mm. although there are, you know, that can be an aspect of really any uh, group, we chose to focus very much on the po on the positive, on the team building, on the, the joy, the passion, the, the, the healthy, like, obsession with uh, information and tactics. And so at the same time, we did not want to glorify the gaming and the and the way to really show the balance was that these kids are very passionate about what they do and, and about what they love and they and sometimes it can overwhelm them and sometimes they can lose their way a little bit um but they have each other to ground themselves and and it's always the stories are always about some aspect of their empathy allowing them to kind of rise above they were trapped the track they were on to be able to listen to be able to like move to a new way of thinking, usually because they're aware that something bigger than them is going on or bigger than their situation or bigger than their momentary obsession, which I think is very important. Um, and I think, you know, right now, you're not just going to see more children's animation, you're going to see more animation because everyone is competing right now in not just a content war, but kind of a quality war for you know, the most eyeballs, but they're willing to diversify and do very different, um, more specific uh, um, shows. Everything doesn't have to be homogenized for one audience or one brand, because there is no one uh, Disney anymore. There are, there, mm -hmm. Disney can be many things depending on what arm of them you're gonna go to, uh, for age group, for personal point of view. Uh, Netflix has really, I think, made huge strides in that where I can go and watch a preschool show or I can watch Castlevania and they <laughs> do equally well. And, you know, I think in other countries, animation has been um, in all sorts of genre for many years, but only for the first time in America, we're starting to see like relationship dramas and, you know, uh, horror and, and, you know, other mediums. So, I think you're gonna be seeing more animation. More animation means, um, you know, new points of view and pathways for imagination. I just think the companies have always looked for original points of view, in my opinion. I think they feel they have a strong show if somebody brings something to the table that's new and fresh, but then they would often say, oh, this is beautiful, let's homogenize it now, <laughs> right? That would be the, the, the shame of the development was that everything would come out the other end looking similar. Well, now it's the opposite. I, I really think now, you know, people are embracing this. And I think the election has absolutely played a part. I mean, we're going to work every day, um, like crying in the elevator and, and people were after the election and people wondering what, what can we do with, all, with what we have. Um, and it just, made us think about you know how we could do something or anything to to influence um and bring about a change so i think i'm rambling at this point um but when i i think the future is very bright and i think you're going to also see a lot of work from um individuals and smaller groups you're going to see a lot of independent work that's going to come in and it's going to take over and show the studios what people want because that was my last point. I think the public now have a voice in the conversation. And if they feel they're being pandered to, they're speaking up and they're being very specific. They're saying, we don't like this, but we like this. Yep. This does not represent LBG, you're right? But this does. And then the mm -hmm. studios have to take that note. 
Right. Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that a wonderful place to be finally? Um, just to expand, and, and we have a lot of questions from the audience, I see it, but, um, and we're going to turn it over to Amanda in just a second, too. It was Juan and um, Zara. You know that our communities are, you know, um, in the industry has not been the choice of, you know, our, the vocation for many of our I immigrant parents, okay? Like, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I can speak... Person. Or any sensible parent, really. <laughs> <laughs> when we're working in the industry now, you know, with MPAC and, and you know, connecting our screenwriters to, to the industry, uh, decision makers such as Dan and, and Sasha and yourselves, I am seeing that change. How are you seeing it? I mean, I, I don't want to put, again, I'm kind of leading the question, but when you stated you wanted to be actors, what happened with your parents? Like, what was it easy? Um, did you say it like that? Did you say I want to be an actor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to place it to you yeah. now, Sarah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's uh, only fair. Before you well, I, I am very fortunate that. Um, oh, sorry, can I just follow up real quick? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that's okay. So, uh, and then what would you? give parents, because we have a lot of parents watching today, and because either on Facebook or on Zoom, because um, I know I emailed them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what advice would you give to the parent when their child says, I, wanna, I want a career in screenwriting. I want to do this as a living, not as a hobby. So mm -hmm. both of you, I want you to put on kind of your Muslim hat and just answer that question. Wow, uh, I, I'm not a parent. Yeah, so I don't really can't really speak to that aspect of it. But as uh, as someone who has had parents, <laughs> my perspective is I I was gonna say I'm very fortunate that I came from a family where my parents were pretty liberal when it came to not dictating what their children had to do. They were both medical doctors, um, but none of uh, my siblings who are listening, shout out to you guys, none of us are medical doctors ourselves. In fact, all of us kind of went into professions that have to do with language and communication and teaching. So it's, uh, and my sister Salma is also an actor, shout out, hey Salma. Um, so, we were very fortunate to have parents who nurtured our interests and trusted us to figure out how to make it work financially. Um, I remember my dad was like, yeah, go, go, you know, be an actor, go, but um, maybe get your MBA too, just in case. <laughs> so I come, I, I realize that I'm very privileged in that way because a lot of people from South Asian um, American community, immigrant families, their parents don't see it the same way. And they didn't necessarily have the same support from their family that I did. Uh, but I will say to parents, there are ways to make a living in this industry that don't look like what you think they do. You don't have to be Brad Pitt to have a successful career in Hollywood and be able to have enough money to take care of a family. You know, there are other paths in this industry that aren't as shiny and glamorous as what you think it, you have to get, achieve, where you can make a comfortable, happy living. Voiceover is one of them. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll say is you kind of have to trust your kid to do what's best for them because they know if they have enough self-awareness and experience and education and nurturing, I think you can trust your child to to guide themselves with your loving nurturance. Um, so go forward, don't be afraid, but be smart about it. That's kind of where I'm at today. <laughs> Riz? Um, <laughs> uh, I um, will also say that my parents were, uh, they were very concerned when I told them I wanted to be an actor. They were also not like, you can't do this. They were more on the line of, yes, get your degree first, go to, go to university, get your degree, and then you'll, then you can, if you still want to do this, because you'll hope, I think they were trying, they were basically saying, at some point when you're not, <laughs> you know, when you're an adult, you're going to figure out that you don't want to do this anymore. And that just never happened. So, um, but they were never like, you can't do this. So I was also very lucky that my parents were very supportive uh, in, in, in that aspect of it. Uh, I do, uh, Sue, I have to say that there has been a change from the 
Facebook messages and the Instagram messages I get from parents who's, who's like, my kid has this talent I would love, like, can I get any advice? I think that, I think that it's changing and I don't think there's, I think parents are being very uh, supportive, which I'm very excited about. And as Zara said, it's like, it's lucrative. This is not just like something or like, Hey, go in and do your hobby. And like, whatever, like you can make money, you can, you can earn a living and you can have three children, crazy children, like I do, who are insane, who I'm also like, yeah, go into this business. No, I'm not. But um, <laughs> <laughs> if they want to, but uh, I, I do, I do feel like there's a change. And I also feel like it's a good change. And I think they're realizing now that there is, it is a, it is a viable business to be in. The entertainment business is a business and you can make money out of it, as Zara said. And so why not? Why not? I agree. Like anything else? Yeah. I'm not, I'm saying we do need a lot of doc, uh, we, we still need a lot yes. of doctors. So don't, we, we need to have all, yes. so thank you to your parents because we do need a lot of doctors. Yes. So don't stop doing that. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Um, I, we're going to turn it over to, back to Iman, but I just want to say thank you again for being part of the change. You are very special to us, all four of you. We need more of you. We need more people like you. Keep up the good work. Keep moving the needle. Um, if there's anything the Hollywood Bureau can do for you, never hesitate to ask. You guys are family now. You're all family. And so thank you. Thank you on a personal note um, to Zara and to... Um, Riz, Ramadan Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. Ramadan yeah. Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. Yeah, and thank you all for participating in our Ramadan videos. Oh, that yeah, was that was fun. fun. Sure. I loved everyone's videos. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for that. And Iman, we're going to turn it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Before we, we get to a QA, and I feel like we need to pitch another show idea called The Super Sue or something, because you have so yes! many fun <laughs> and quirky um, adventures that you can go on. You can have a sidekick named Amon. We, we can talk more often. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, but, you know, as I'm reading some of these questions, and ba back to the last question that Sue asked, um, just to share a little bit, I took on a project this weekend of painting a very, very small room in my house. I and mean, you'll see by all this paint on my hands that I was very, about, it was over my head, certainly. But, but while I was painting, I was just thinking about, you know, the strength and the grit and the intelligence that it takes to be a creator, actor, producer, anyone who, who can make a masterpiece like the projects that you guys have worked on. But just like Rome, you know, glitch text and Mirror Royal Detective weren't made in, in just a day. So for those who do aspire to be in these positions, especially the younger generation, I know that we spoke a little bit about what we can say to parents and approaching um, them from a child or a young adult's perspective, but, but what is the advice that you have on how to get started and perhaps even a note on persistence and perseverance for the younger generation? Um, I, I'd like to start in that I have a, a comment for, for those uh, young people and that's also in a way for their parents. No one should be, in my opinion, um, waiting to do this. If, if you have a uh, something in you that wants to draw, you need to pick up a pencil. And if you want to, if you find yourself compelled to make silly noises or use silly voices or, you know, um, play in front of your mirror, um, you need to do that. And when parents see that, they should feed that. And because it's really all you'll ever have to do. If that is something that you derive pleasure from and something that happens where you actually then get very specific about it and start to read about it. I mean, I know eight and nine year olds that make elaborate stop motion videos in Minecraft and, you know, um, uh, and, and with Legos and, you know, and even if they're eight years old and they're not doing that, but they're really interested in reading about them or watching videos on how they're made or, you know, it's, it's something to really feed and I think over time, you seek out the others who like to do those same things, whether it's online or in social, uh, physical social groups, and you build communities and it never stops. It's gonna be that way when you're eight, it's gonna be that way in high school, and it's gonna be that way um, in your industry. And if parents are seeing that kind of passion, then I think they can know it's a good, it's, it's worth feeding and I think it's good advice to say, well, we want you to get your degree as well. 
because guess what? That's it, it will still help with the other things you're pursuing. But I think the only caution is that child who just says, I want to be an actor, and then asks for the address of the become an actor, you know, um, where they buy the become an actor starter kit. That's a, a red flag, you know, or when they're staring out the window waiting for somebody to drive by and notice them. But if they are obsessed and sneaking out to go make movies in the driveway with their iPhones or whatever, then you probably have, you know, you, you have a passion that should be fed. Any other input, anyone? Um, I, actually, can I read a quote that I have up at, on my desk? Um, and I only recently put it up, but what you said, Iman, about persistence, um, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of a famous quote. It's by Calvin Coolidge, um, but the, it just says so much. Anyway, press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men, it's dated, with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education alone will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are un omnipotent. Mm -hmm. I, I think, um, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, no, it's just so powerful to me because it's, it's just, you got to keep going <laughs> no matter what. Absolutely. And I, and I commend all of the hard work that you guys are putting in when it comes to representation. I know we have one question from a viewer as young as seven years old, Ivana Grace. You put her name in there for, for real, so I want to give that a shout out. Um, she says, especially for Mr. Sasha and Mr. Rizwan, aka character Mr. Khan, what is a historical hero that helped inspire you in life? Great. I'm gonna do that to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot. Um, but I, well, <laughs> lately I've been thinking a lot about President Obama. Um, I think uh, his um, power to unite not everybody, but um, a lot of people with his words um, was really inspiring to me. Um, He's such a forceful and powerful. Um, speaker and the fact that with his words he can inspire so many people um, that's something I aspire to uh, it's it's very hard for me to answer that question I um, there's so many people I mean there's people here do you know what I mean there's like Sue who's doing so much great work and Sasha and Dan. like there's just there's people I think that we're in this in in this world where we were at we're at this place where we're where we as a community can make change and we're gonna we're hopefully we will um you know build this community together and i it's it's so hard to ask that question because there's so many people have, that have been a part of uh of my life that i've like turned to and so to, to, to answer it as one person is just sort of it's it's very difficult for me i got i saw the question on the thing and i so and i've been I've been like, I know I'm going to get asked the question and I, and I was like, I'll have an answer when it comes to me. And I, was like, <laughs> me too. I, and like, I went through so many. I was like, oh no, not that. I mean, <laughs> I, had a I was like, <laughs> who do I say? Who do I say? And then it took me like the whole time, like the last 40 minutes to land on. <laughs> it's such a hard question. It's such a hard question because there's so many people. And then if you say one person, you're like, wait, this is not the be all and end all. Do you know what I mean? There's people who you might not even know. There's people in my community. There's so many people. That. Absolutely. I think that speaks to the the testament of what you know the American fabric even is. It's not just one color or one texture or or one anything. It's it's a beautiful accumulation of so many different things and experiences and people. Um, so I agree with you. I don't think that I could have picked just one either. So I think a beautifully said um, response. But a testament to such an amazing question that you have stumped to two people. <laughs> like, it's such a great question. Good job, Thank good you, job, Ivana. Ivana. <laughs> so our next question um, gets a bit more serious in that it asks, um, that have you all found that the preferred approach in children's media is depicting worlds without anti-Muslim sentiment or depicting worlds in which characters must deal with anti-Muslim sentiment? What are your thoughts and where do writers, children, psychology consultants, and studios lean? I mean, you have to read that again. Yeah. Sure thing, sure thing. So have you all found that the preferred approach in children's media is depicting worlds without anti-Muslim se sentiment or depicting worlds in which characters must deal with anti-Muslim sentiment? 
What are your thoughts and where do writers, children psycho mm. psychology consultants and studios lean? Um, I, I guess wow. even simply kind of put when, when creating, are you tackling this reality that anti-Muslim or Islamophobia, you know, exists or are we kind of tailoring a world that is more, you know, utopic? What, yes. which way is an idealized depiction or a realist, you know, a reflection of the current struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, speaking for myself, I'm not a psychologist and that's exactly the kind of thing that, uh, in dealing with another show where, we're developing certain themes. It's exactly the kind of conversation I want to have because we want to ask specifically, well, what is better for a certain age group? What I loved about Star Trek was that, and what I don't see enough anymore of, in my opinion, including in Star Trek, is a utopian um, society, not free of problems, but I, I really am hungry to see a world where um, these struggles are more a thing of the past. There, there, were, there were characters of color in that universe who, when confronted with uh, racism, didn't even really understand at first that was what was happening. That's how far uh, humanity had come. Now, that, that's maybe uh, way too far. Then you risk being unrealistic. So for children, what I think is best in a world like Glitch Text, we did not want to actively depict um, toxicity against female gamers. There wasn't an overt awareness. We didn't make fun of people for their differences or score points off them when they were awkward because we wanted to not, you know, continue showing that as uh, or normalizing it in a way for younger minds. We just wanted to set a world where um, they were, you know, interacting uh, without it being part of the conversation because we hope that that would set a good example. But that's different than, than a show where I think somebody might want to do stories that, that teach coping skills or, you know, I, I, I don't know that there's a right or wrong about it. I'm sure it's just the tone of the, of the show and yeah, what I mean, they ultimately want to say. Yeah, I mean, for us, our show aims at a preschool audience. And um, while we do get into some, you know, pretty, you know, um, complex issues on a preschool level, that is sort of a bridge too far for us. Um, the other part of it for our show, since we're, we, it's set in a pre-colonial era, um, we, uh, you know, we did a lot of research about that historical time period. And one of the things that was really inspiring and fascinating was that in Rajasthan and South Asia at that time, parts of South Asia, um, there was a real intermingling of, of Hindus and Muslims and Christians, like they could all serve in the royal court together. And, and it was actually, you know, very accepted and everyone, it was actually a really beautiful, harmonious time um, in some ways. Um, and so um, it, it, to us, hopefully we're not just sugarcoating it, but we're presenting this, um, this reality in a way, uh, in a way that hopefully can be inspiring to kids and creating the future. I think can if I, I just, uh, just wanted to make the point real quick that if I had to, I would probably try to look for something in the, in the thematics of our show to do a story where one of the characters is perhaps victimized or marginalized um, in a way that all the characters and the audience could probably relate to rather than make it specific to one of them. That's for our sh show. Um, so that it's sort of everybody had a point of access and it wasn't singling anyone out. And it's not really out of fear, but in an attempt to try to be inclusive to, to everyone and to try to impart empathy that's accessible to everyone, not just the target, you know? Um, but again, I don't know. I, uh, if I were to do something with those issues, I would definitely seek, uh, you know, specifics from the writers and the consultants and find out as much as I could. Sorry, who's... Oh, I just wanted to add in as a sidebar to this conversation. I love that both Glitch Text and Mirror Royal Detective depict relationships between Hindus and Muslims positively. Like in Glitch Text, you have Hanish, who's an Indian character, and 
uh, Zara, who is, I don't think her country is necessarily specified, but she's a Muslim character. And as someone who is of Indian and Pakistani origin, to see Muslims and Hindus being depicted as getting along and collaborating and coexisting in children's media is so important. So sidebar, awesome, awesome job there. I think um, in regards to the question, both viewpoints are valid, both showing a society where it doesn't exist and a society where, like you said, Dan, there's coping tools. I'm in a show called Young Justice uh, that's on DC Universe, produced by Warner Brothers Animation. And in our season three, which aired this past year, there was a story, I played a character who um, inhabited the body of a Middle Eastern refugee girl. And there were flashbacks that showed this refugee girl's life and the racism she faced and kind of factored into how she was then moving forward in the present. And so there are shows like, again, but that show is for teenagers. It's like a darker superhero, grittier show. So they tackle those issues. Um, So all that to say, there's so many different ways to handle this. I think all of them are valid. And I'm really excited that all of those different ways are in the shows that I'm working on. It's cool. Yes. I, I also think that there's um, there's great value in having um, um, a visual medium where it's something that you aspire to, right? Like, I think they talk about that mm. um, you know, for Shit's Creek, a show that I'm on, um, where it deals with a lot of marginalized communities. Like, you know, there's... Uh, they, Dan was asked the question, well, why is there no like homophobia in, 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 uh, in Schitt's Creek? And he said, well, I wanted to create a world where, where it's maybe a, be- a world that's better than, than the, one, the world that we live in. And so it's, it's an aspirational world. And why not have that? I, I feel like that's interesting. If we live in an aspirational world and people, as you say, if it's kids that are watching, kids are watching these, uh, um, these shows and then they get into teenagers when they're watching and you're saying, wait, this kind of world can exist. Why should we accept anything less than, than this world that we've created? And I think that that's, that's, that's important. That's important. I love how you said that, Riz. That's great. It's yeah. very uplifting to hear that that both uh, perspectives are are highly taken because I know from from uh, having younger sisters I know how nice it is to to be in a space where they don't even realize that certain issues exist because yeah. they identify with every character you know it's like yeah. oh someone scraped a knee someone doesn't know how to ride a bike that's me it doesn't matter what they look like or what that's me I I align with that. In the same sense, I remember being younger and watching Proud Family and them having an Islam episode and finally feeling like, oh my gosh, like someone gets it, you know? So both are absolutely so, so important. And, and your all's work is just phenomenal and encompassing all of that. Um, and with that being said, we're, we're going to close very soon. But for those who are just itching to watch, who, who might not know yet, can you guys please share what platform we can watch each show on, please? Sure. Um, Mirror Royal Detective is on Disney Junior um, multiple times per week. There are new episodes premiering every Friday on Disney Channel at 11 a.m. And then it's also on the Disney Now app. Uh, Glitch Text is uh, currently on Netflix. The first um, 10 half hours, it's actually nine full episodes. Uh, are up right now, and in a couple months, ten more will be um, will be dropping on the platform. So, you can just check us out on uh, your. It, we're over 150 countries uh, and many different languages, which is phenomenal. So we're so thankful. Absolutely, I know that many of us have a, a few hours to kill before iftar time so now i know exactly what i'm going to be watching <laughs> yeah Put family down and watch with me um but thank you so much to all of our phenomenal guests sasha zehra rizwan and dan it has been such a joy having you on truly thank, thank you. you so, so much thank for you me. thank you so much for wow. having us and thank, thank you, you also so to all of our viewers. Um, we thank you so much for your support in watching our webinars. And for any information on upcoming webinars, please visit www.impact.org forward slash webinars. Um, please have a blessed remainder of your Ramadan for those who are celebrating. And to all, we hope you are staying safe and well. Goodbye for now. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>